Hi. Hello, everyone. It's um, pretty far from me, all the way from Australia. Um, so thanks for having me here. Now, what I'm going to talk about is Docker. Docker has been a project I've been involved in over the last two and a half years. How many people are familiar with it by a raise of hands? All right, so we have some. Um, how many people are familiar with static site generators? We have some more. Different hands sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, and how many people are familiar with ExpressJS? So nearly everyone. So what Docpad is, is it's kind of like a hybrid web architecture. It has a bunch of features, but we really do pitch it as a web architecture. And the reason we do that is it's built on top of Express, but it allows you to use static site generation ability. So you can write a dynamic website, but compile it to a static environment. So you can actually deploy to GitHub pages, Apache, or whatever. And for a lot of things, such as clean URLs or the page plugin, we can actually create static compilation for those things, so they will actually run on static environments very, very well. And it, it, it's really quite nifty, but I'll show you all the different things. Um, who here actually are working with CMSs right now? Who here would consider themselves a CMS developer? How many would consider yourself a web developer? Okay. So one of the, the best way to start is probably just to start off with my frustrations. I actually came from a Zen framework background, a PhD, and as I was continuing with web development, things got more and more difficult, um, and what I thought should be really easy actually became really, really complicated to actually achieve. It took a lot of time to accomplish things that I thought should be really, really simple. And uh, yeah, two and a half years ago, about three years ago, a project called Jekyll came out by Tom Preston Werner, one of the GitHub co-founders, where he reevaluated: do we really need a dynamic website, a website that uses, um, that generally re-renders each request every single time, caching always is an afterthought rather than something that's always out of the box, and that kind of makes it quite slow. And with that CMS, if it is re-rendering every single time, it also opens yourself up to security issues as well. And you have to make sure you keep your CMS up to date. And as that continues, the CMS takes a mindset of we have to add more and more features to facilitate everyone in the CMS. And you end up having to learn the CMS, or at least for Zen Framework, I spent about six months learning it. And the same applies for WordPress from what I've heard from all the WordPress developers and Drupal developers as well. And you spend all your time learning it, and at the end, you really do become a CMS developer rather than a web developer. And you also, with that complexity introduced, you have to set up your local environment, install your database, deployment becomes quite difficult. And I just have some water. Yeah, it's water, I got a nifty little water bottle. <laughs> <laughs> it fits in like the airport seat, like really, really well. Yeah. So finally, the, one of the other big points is, say for WordPress, you kind of are a bit locked into the WYSIWYG editor it provides. And a lot of people actually just write their content in Markdown and then kind of copy and paste it over, or write it in a different program and copy and paste it over, or Microsoft Word for some clients. I started chatting with a bunch of people and we look, we really enjoyed this static site generation ability that Jekyll had. We were like, this is absolutely amazing. But when we tried to implement, we found that as we were implementing it, it, it couldn't bend in the ways we wanted. It was specifically just for blogging and trying to use it to build web applications actually became quite difficult. And Node.js was pretty early in those days. It was about 0 0.3 or 0 0.4 was just coming out. And it had this, huge ambition of, hey, we can actually make the Node.js core final, and we can write little modules that will tie together to create something amazing. And we're like, okay, as a JavaScript developer myself, I was like, great, we can use Node, we can benefit from its asynchronous work, and we can make a really amazing static site generator, but use the Express Web Framework to be able to extend it and provide dynamic abilities and still generate um, a static site. And doing that, 
we have a static site so we can have incredible speed. Um, sometimes you can get a thousand requests a second if your machine's good enough, but that's even on my basic laptop compared to a few requests a second on your traditional CMS. And everything is done as a plugin. We have a huge plugin infrastructure. We have over 120 contributors that have contributed to the project over time. And we've got tons and tons of plugins. The Docpad website is coded in Docpad as well as my website, and I'll show you the nifty things behind that soon. Now, we'll cover these things a bit more as we go through. Now, does anyone have any questions before I continue? Questions are good. Yeah. Yeah, so we come with some pre-built skeletons, um, which are just like node projects, or just GitHub projects that you can clone out, and then you can get started with a skeleton um, pretty easily. However, in terms of theming, that would be something that's implemented per skeleton. So by default, we come with like HTML5, boilerplate skeletons, Twitter bootstrap, um, the Docpad website, my own website, and a few others, like one for, these two actually for slides, this is a chat server. Um, this one is actually for running conference websites, which is quite nifty. And it, as people create more and more, <laughs> more <laughs> open source <laughs> solutions and actually give this stuff away for free, um, we'll be able to add more skeletons. But in terms of like actually having one skeleton and changing the look and feel, that's something that would be implemented on a skeleton. And then you could actually generate it for different environments. One website that does that type of thing pretty well is browser diet. Um, Docpad is actually pretty big in Brazil <laughs> and this was made by a Brazilian company down there and it's how to lose weight in the browser. So how can we apply all these best practices to actually keep it down? And what they've kind of done is these localizations are just different environments the Docpad website is generated again. So you would tell the Docpad compiler generate now for English, generate now for French, and you could do the same for theming. Or you could just actually, in your style sheet, just make it take in a request variable and generate it a different theme or compile it to different files. So the only French is still in the structure or yeah. still in the Yeah, so there is a structure behind it, and the way it works is we have, okay, I'll actually just get it up. I'll explain this as we go. Cool. So I'll actually get started. How much programming do we want in this compared to the theory aspect? I mean, I'm happy to bounce around and just talk about it or I can showcase it as well. Programming is good. Yeah. All right, sweet. So if we, ins we install Docpad with, with NPM, so NPM install. Can everyone see that or do I need to make it bigger? Is that, right. is that good? All right, so we installed it like that. I won't install it now because I've already got it installed. And we'll make a new directory. So make test, cd test. Now when we first run Docpad, it's gonna detect that this is an empty website and will be offered to pick a skeleton that we actually wanna use. So we can pick like say the BL Upson website, which is my own. And it'll go out, it'll clone it out, do the NPM installs of all the different plugins. And we have a fair few plugins. And this is a good thing, because it means that we isolate as much of the stuff in the plugins as we can, and we try and keep the core as lean as possible. For instance, partials is something which people are always like, why isn't partials in the core? It's such a common thing. It isn't because it doesn't need to be. And with that, we can actually make the core really lean and make it as agnostic as possible with possible implementations. So partials can be implemented one way. And for instance, with marked, we have many different markdown plugins. Do you want it rendered with JavaScript or do you want it compiled with C? So there's marked, which does the JavaScript rendering, and there's also RobotScript that actually uses the Sundown library, which compiles with C. So it's faster, but it doesn't run on Windows. Right, so we actually, we have all these different abilities. Now rendering happens from extension, so this will render from CoffeeScript to JavaScript, right? And this is cool because then we can compile things as well, combine things. So we can do .html.markdown.echo to add an echo temp 
containing engine on top of Markdown on top of HTML. And that has, is actually pretty useful at times. Now we have all these different types of plugins to add extra functionality. So one to make our URLs kind of show more like your WordPress clean URLs. Clean URLs to just get rid of the extension. Feeder pulls in data from remote sources. I'll actually showcase this in the Doppad website very soon. And a whole bunch of pigments with syntax highlighting. Deployers help us deploy to different websites, so we just write that and we'll actually deploy to GitHub pages for a static environment. And we'll handle that behind and do it. And the agnostic aspect comes into play with the admin interface. So a lot of people will be like, hey, I've heard Dophead is a CMS. Well, it's true, you can manage your content, but the default interface for that is the file system. You write your content as files on the computer and Dophead will compile it. However, you can add a CMS on top of it as plugins. And that actually allows people to always create the best CMS for the particular client base, which is really cool. We have these two as plugins and we also have a pro setup. So for instance, the Doppad website actually uses pros to edit the documentation. And as they make changes, the Doppad website will actually go away and it'll regenerate itself. And very soon, so this week, we've actually got Tumblr support as well. So you can get Tumblr content imported directly into your Doppad project and use Tumblr as your, in, your actual GUI. And you could use WordPress as your GUI or anything as your GUI. So you could import things from Mongo database as well if you're wanting your website to refresh live on regeneration. So the Doppad website has cloned out the VL Upton website, it's installed it, all of the dependencies, and it's actually got caught here. So I'm thinking maybe there's a proxy issue. Is there or not? Because right now we talk to GitHub to actually fetch in a bunch of data for us. But that's okay. I'll show you what should happen if that goes smoothly. The BA Lofton website pulls in all of this data live from different areas. Um, and on the right hand side, it pulls in this stuff live as well. And this uses the feeder plugin. We then tell the Doppad website to regenerate every hour. So it provides the illusion that it's a static website or a dynamic website because this content is updating in a relative enough time that we think it is a dynamic site. And it generates it every hour, so it's still got all the benefits of a static website, so it's still incredibly fast. And the projects is all pulled in through GitHub as well. So all this data is actually pulled in from remote sources. And this is something which, if it was done in Zen Framework, it would like blow my mind how I would possibly accomplish this in a quick time, when using the feeder plugin actually gets really, really easy. Um, do you have a, can you run a publish model? I.e. it doesn't update every hour, it updates when you publish? Yeah, yeah, so the, the way to get it to update every hour is, is actually a configuration property called regenerate every and then you just specify the milliseconds. By default, it just updates when you write doppad run or doppad generate. Yeah. Regenerate the entire site, are you saying? Um, on regenerations, it only regenerates what it needs to. So if I'm editing like a blog post, then it will update the blog post and it will also update this listing page as well because this listing page references that blog post. However, if I'm updating the home page, it will just update the home page because it's the only thing that references the home page. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'll dive in with like a fresh skeleton considering my, my doc pad, my BL Upton website fell over. If it keeps happening, it will be fixed very soon. But I tried it out before we arrived and it worked fine. Actually, let me see if this test directory is actually in here. Oh no, I'm already in here. Good. All right. So we'll just say we want to start from scratch. It'll install Doppad. Um, so it'll install it locally, so for deployment, we'll actually be able to deploy it fine. And it's actually gotten started. Now, if we actually look at what environment it's actually created, we'll see that it's created a few files for us. You don't need these files, but it's just really good practice. For instance, package.json contains some basic information and contains
contains the information we need if we want to deploy on a Node.js web server. For instance, if we specify Docad as a dependency, and that's the script that could start up. So that will not run watching, for instance, to reject, check our file system of changes because we're on a production server, we don't need to. It will generate a configuration file where we add configuration. It will generate the source directory, which contains three folders. Documents, which are for documents that we want to render. Files, which is anything we don't want to render, but we still want to have actually indexed in our database. And layouts. Now, by a raise of hands, how many people know what layouts are? All right. A few people and some people not that impressed. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll actually just get started. I'm creating index.html, and as we see, it just detected that and it's already compiled it in the output directory. So we'll write some data. And it also tells us where it's actually hosted on, which is localhost. And it tells us as we keep going, why, is there something wrong with my markup or not? Because it's compiled, oh, it's there, okay. My computer's just running really slow. All right, so we got hello world. Oh, I know why, I don't have live reload on yet. <laughs> yeah, so we're, we're still very basic right now, we're just starting off. So we've got that, but let's abstract this stuff out into a layout, because that's pretty lame, it being there. So let's just call it default, and we'll use the echo templating engine, because as it's a layout, we need a way to, say, inject this content into our page. Now, echo is actually just embedded CoffeeScript. So in CoffeeScript, at is this. So we could write that, but it doesn't look as nice, especially when you're trying to do templating. The minus sign will say output and without escaping it. If we use an equal sign, it'll actually escape. So if we just do that and we'll save it, and now we'll tell this to use the layout default. Now, this hasn't worked because we haven't actually installed the Echo extension or the Echo plugin yet, so it doesn't know how to render it, but it does tell us we probably want to do something. So we can install the Echo extension like that, which is exactly the same as doing Docpad plugin Echo. And that'll go away, it'll grab it, and now we're good. We can run Docpad run again, and now it actually know, and we don't get that error. So if we go back here, it's actually rendered correctly. Now that's not that nifty yet. We've just got layouts. But let's say I want to then write that in markdown. We'll install the markdown plugin, which we'll use marked in this instance. Start up again. And now we've actually got it rendering with markdown. Now, Let's get live reload because that's going to be a bit annoying if we don't. So to do live reload, we need to enable plugins to be able to inject data. Sorry, I'll make that bigger. What do you got? Is that big enough? Yeah. Okay. So one for meta. We have three blocks. One for meta, another one for scripts, and another one for styles. And we'll just check if that's worked. It has. So it's already added our default metadata. We can turn this off if we really don't like to let people know we're running Docpad. But it indicates that it's working. So if we actually want to do live reload, let's install the live reload plugin. This will bring in, a, it will listen for changes or generations with Docpad and it will use Socket.io to alert the client that a change has been made and that'll refresh the page. Now, we're actually gonna move away from Socket.io. Um, one of you was asking earlier, was you, no? Who was it? You, yeah, you, there we go. 
So there's an issue about that. Everything's open source um, as much as we can. And now if I edit this, we'll actually start seeing that it's actually going to start doing live reloading. This is really strange. Because it generates it fine out here, but it's not accessing it. Oh, I know why. Because you have to refresh to get live reload enabled. It didn't have live reload enabled then. See? Now we're good. Now, this is pretty standard stuff which you'll see in a static side journal generator. But where the power kind of comes in is if we start writing blog posts. So Now, we'll add some echo to this. So we can throw in some templating. And we'll actually say for posts in Jeff Our database is powered by Backbone.js which allows to JSON is back from JS, but we provide some helper functions here. If there is an error during the initial compilation, we'll actually just yell at you and actually tell you something's def definitely wrong. I'm thinking maybe it could be that we've combined with Markdown as well. So just try it like this. Anyone know what unexpected dedent means? Unexpected. Oh. The dreaded colon. <laughs> there we go. Well, so, thanks for bearing with me there. The anchor tag? What do you mean the anchor tag? Oh, let's just make that A. There we go. Thank you. So we've got the links going. Now, that's, that's okay, that's all right. But this is actually completely um, powered by, well it's not powered by, but we implement the Mongo database, the NoSQL implementation for our querying here. So we can actually just do um, get files and we can actually spef specify a Mongo database query. So we would say, if we just wanna get something that starts with a capital H, starts with and we just get high. This gets crazily powerful because you can instantly start querying the documents you actually create, which is pretty fast and you can do some pretty powerful things. However, this isn't that efficient because we're doing this query every single time. It will be awesome if we could just do this query once. <coughs> For that, there's a feature in Docpad called Custom Collections. So we can make this like that and just abstract it out into a collection called post. Then we can do get collection post. And it'll still work, which is good. Let's just check that it does work and we'll change that to a G. There. Now this gets, this is way faster because it just does the check only once. So as we change files, it does the, 
querying or the filtering as the file is actually changed rather than querying something every single time. So if you actually have a menu listing and you have like a thousand different pages, it'll actually only do that query once rather than a thousand times for each menu it has to render. So that's part of the power that actually comes in. Now, I can keep adding on these little tiny things, but it, it probably, probably could go a bit longer. Is there anything someone wants to actually see like right now? Yep. Pardon? Yeah, so you would actually have, there's a few ways you can do that. One way is we can extend the template data, so what's actually accessible to a templating engine, just by template data, and then some, some var, and then some value, right? And then we can access that inside our template data. We can then specify different environment configurations, so when we're running on the dev environment, or let's say the French environment, Let's use some different um, templating template data like this. Bar and then onion. Hello. So it could be like that. That's one way, right? Another way we could actually do is inside our file, we can actually just have different files for different extensions, right? Um, the, the power is you can actually accomplish it whichever way you would think is best for your use case. The way, um, the person who did this browser diet website, he's actually going to do up a guide pretty soon all about how you accomplish internationalization of stuff. Yeah. Like a pod file or something. I'd say talk to Zeno about that. He's he's been big into the internationalization, and this website's open source, so you could probably check that out as well. Uh, is there anything someone else want to see, or Neil? Do you have any suggestions of what something's really cool to show? Off? Uh, yeah. Feel free to shout out. What's the biggest? Uh, what's the biggest idea? That's a good question. So we've had a fair few sites actually go up and I'm not sure which one would actually be the biggest. I know game icons is pretty, pretty darn big. So the way this actually works is all these files are just file, like icon files as SVG and PNG inside the files directory. They then use the querying, which we just demoed, to actually display all of this and do the counts and provide tags for different things as well. So as I do that, it's actually generated a static page for all of the different game icons that use that. And this website is, is pretty large. That, that's a lot of icons. Um, now, I know as well, Adobe uses it for top coat. Microsoft has used it for, what, what is the thing? It's like Nugget Co-op, there we go. And anyone use Zen coding that much? Or not at all? Emmet, which is it? This is like a cool thing that came up many years ago. And they've updated all their documentation to use it as well. But you get some pretty big sites that actually use it and sometimes they keep them like internal because they use it for a local <coughs> situation like an internal intranet and we get the stats on that. So yeah, there are pretty big sites using it. And this one. Is it being used for a documentation at all? For yeah. Some? Yeah. So the all of this documentation is actually just a repo on the GitHub of every website. So for every documentation. So everything's just markdown files. We have our metadata at the top and the different stuff. And then that's actually pulled into the Doppad website. I'll go up one. We 
we have a plugin to clone out the Docker documentation to the source documents docs directory. So clone that repo out um, before the generation starts, give all the markdown files available, Docker will then know about them so it can render them just like, as it normally would. And with GitHub, we actually have a post um, hook on this repo. So when a prose IO commit gets merged inside or a pull request gets merged inside, then we will talk to the Docpad website and send off a regenerate event to it and then we'll tell Docpad to actually regenerate. And we have a key which is okay, so that's all right. But that'll, you know, that's pretty cool. Like we get to regenerate the website as well whenever someone makes a change. Now, one of the interesting things, I'll actually get this up. Hopefully it's working on this environment. It uses an upcoming version of no Docpad, so I'll run the local version. Expander. <laughs> 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 I'm having a good day, am I? Yeah, yeah. Uh, not usually. Sometimes they go pretty smoothly. Alright, okay, that's something I can easily fix. This website pulls in data from all these different services. Um, the Tumblr integration I said before. I really hope the pulling in here actually works. Okay, so it did. It pulled it all in. It's doing its rendering. <laughs> I will, however, show you the hosted version that is <laughs> working. So this website, um, some people may know this came up with Ruby um, a while ago, and it did all the rendering on the server side, and they actually made it so when you clicked one of these things, it was actually really slow because it had to go all the way to GitHub, fetch all the data, and then render it. When with the Docpad feeder plugin, we can pull in all that data into <laughs> Docpad before the generation, perform the generation, and it will compile it, all this static stuff. And this is Tumblr content, and on the local version, which definitely works if you try it out, because I tested this intensely, it just doesn't work for me. Um, you actually get paging as well, so at the bottom it'll actually pull in all your Tumblr data, allow it to actually be treated as a normal docpad document and give you paging, so you know page one, page two, and actually the next pages. And in a way, you can do it on a Dynamics website or something you can deploy statically or just have it regenerate every hour. And the code behind the site website is, is pretty simple. Um, so we have this configuration file. We tell it to regenerate every hour. We give it some dependencies. All right, we give it some site data, so your website name, just your general things. Some Twitter details, so this is put into our right-hand sidebar. Different links, just to abstract that out because we reuse those links a lot. Template helper, so we can actually expose a helper function to our template data. Our custom collections, so we check if page order exists. If it does, order by the page order and by the title and put all of those things in the pages, post, check everything that has the tag post and sort by date in most recent first. Now plugins, here we say use the Tumblr plugin, put things in the hsmod.echo, use the partial, assign it the data of the partial plugin. This is like really new, it's actually well documented um, as it's being written and in the proper release it'll be even better. So this may look pretty crazy, but as you go through it becomes a lot easier. And this will generate tag pages for our tags. It understands that when we do tags, we probably want to be able to say, okay, when I click this tag, bring up a pa tag page which lists all the documents that have that tag. And this is when we actually pull in data from external services. So we just say fetch this and then make it available to our template data via, it would be feeder.feed.twitter, if that's Twitter. So this website, actually is probably one of the most interesting showcases of what a Docpad website can do. 
and yeah, we're, we're in just in the process of adding this way of getting Tumblr from ex data from external services like Tumblr into the Docker database. That's like been a new thing and it's, it's, it's hitting like this week, which is really cool. So that's like the upcoming functionality. But probably one thing that we're showcasing is because of the flexibility, we actually use it to, some people use it to compile just normal JavaScript projects rather than actual websites. So query engine, which is the NoSQL query abilities for us is actually just compiled as a Docker website. So we have our lib file and that's query engine. And every single time we make a change, it actually runs the tests for us automatically. And we just specify that by saying, okay, in the generate after event, spawn cake test, and then let us know if the test failed or the test passed. So whenever I make a change, after every generation, run the test, which is really, really useful. And then you, with the actual log event, you actually get a nice little growl notification as well. And the demo is handled by that as well. So if we go documents demo, we get to use templating abilities in our actual demo website. And there's a, a few projects done like that. So a scroll plugin for jQuery, slide scroll panel, and JavaScript to coffee, which does what it says, is also coded in, in Docpad now as well, which is really cool. Yeah. That, that was like a lot to show, show everyone. I tried to cram in like a lot then. Um, but yeah, I, I between the URLs, the, the custom URLs, do you, uh, how, do you, how do you host that publication? Or how does that work? Okay, so for clean URLs, when we install the clean URLs plugin, um, if it's running in a dynamic environment, so via Node.js web server, then it will just extend the routes for it. So if I want to, it will find out, okay, just remove the extensions and then add the necessary routes. If I'm actually running on a static environment, um, then it'll actually generate redirect documents for us instead. So we can actually delve into the source. I'm pretty sure it's pretty small. So create the clean URLs, set the primary URL, add all the secondary URLs that would be the clean ones. So for instance, this strips off the extensions. That allows us to just use slash if it's just an index page. And if we are a dynamic website, Docpad already handles that because it understands URLs and does all that mapping. If we're in a static website, we actually generate static redirect documents. So if we check it out, so I think here, it actually generates a normal redirect document that'll work in a static environment. And that's just by running um, docpad generate and static. You tell it to do a static environment, live reload will turn off, clean URLs will generate for a static environment. Most of the plugins are aware of this, which do require dynamic abilities. Yeah. Some plugins, if they require a dynamic server, they'll just actually tell you we need a dynamic server. Yeah. So that was the plugin, the, uh, the Rima file, which uh, generates Yeah, so it cycles through I may need to get my charger out. That's not it. So on the right event, it cycles through the database and figures it out with that code. As in, how do we, can you elaborate? Well, you're saying it's iterating through the database and yeah. finding out what's changed. Yeah. So is it a JSON file somewhere or is it like an actual database? Do you mean the, the oh, yeah, so the database is all in memory because it's a backlink collection. Yeah. That's why you don't have to install a database. And that's also why it's really, really fast. Is that all you really got to for this plugin? Yeah. So the models, the documents are actually backbone um, models and the collections say, when we do our custom collections, yeah, that's all just backbone. Query Engine provides us with this NoSQL abilities, but I mean, we could just do like fluff and all the normal stuff you would do on backbone as well.
Any other questions? So, are we good? Level dependencies. All right. How do you mean by dependencies? So one page depends on another, depends on another. What is this talk? I guess that's part of it. Oh, that tiny little thing. We have really big ones. <laughs> <laughs> That's tiny. Wow. Okay. Um, so, what do you mean by dependency? So, in the regeneration code, you change some small bit of the page in a partial. Yeah. Yeah, currently we, um, we, if they reference the database at any point, so reference um, any file that would reference something <coughs> outside of it, then we track that and we say this document references other documents. So if a change is made um, to a file, then we re-render the things that do re-reference other documents. Now, that's just like an and or thing. It's not actually we specifically say this document references these documents. That is coming, that's like a definite feature and something we can look at. So this is also essential if you want to do CSS rendering, right? Because CSS depends on all these different files. So if we modify one file, we want to generate the file that actually references all the other ones as well. So that's how we do it. The core won't because we don't need to do it in the core. Our plugin will. Um, so we have our Uglify plugin that'll just throw it all through Uglify. There's also integration with Grunt is pretty easy. We actually just provide an example on that on the Doppad website. So guides are just like general things that won't require a plugin. So Grunt integration is actually just really easy because most people are already using Grunt for this. So we'll just add this event to the Docker configuration file and it'll spawn off Grunt and it'll do it. Personally, I just use Cloudflare and then they minify everything post-deployment for me. So I don't have to worry. Does it provide some kind of life cycle? So you can set something at different, different, uh, different points of the whole rendering scheme in order yep. to intend any kind of customization to deploy? Yeah. So these are all the different events we actually provide um, and we say when it's happening and render for instance is when we render from one extension to the other so the in extension the out extension what data is available so to do compression we would probably do that in the right after if we just want to write it to a file or we could actually do it right before and actually write it to the database instead if we want to do it that way Yeah, so in the in-memory database, update the in-memory database with the content. So Grunt, however, needs to be in right after because Grunt only works with physical files. When things like Uglify would probably work in the right before event because it can just do it in memory. It's a, it's a, yeah, I'll pull up the source for you. Can I make this a little bit smaller? It's kind of difficult to read that. So that's our different query helpers that we provide. Now, there will actually probably be something which is reset collections. And we create a new files collection. A files collection is just a backbone collection. Well, it extends a query collection, which gives us all the NoSQL queries, but query engine just extends a normal backbone JS collection. So when we actually create a document, the documents are just backbone models. So we just extend a model and we add our different abilities to it. Yep. And these are all the different metadata properties. They do different things, so we pre-populate most of them and tell you what they are.
Um, it failed with Require.js websites. It um, it has it overwrites or uses the word require or something, and it doesn't work when you're using Require.js. Um, so you actually have to patch it um, in terms of that. And the 0 0.9 version hasn't been updated for a long time. Um, and it does, it's loading in a way of trying to do the slowest, no, the best thing first. And the best thing first may not always be available. So the initialization is actually quite slow for it. When Engine.io, which will be used in Socket.io version one, whenever that comes out, um, will actually do it so it does the way that will work in all browsers first and then upgrades to what would be best. So that initialization time will be as best, like as short as possible. However, we just find it's overkill. So we're, we're going to use something much more lightweight as well. And there's actually an issue about that in the Stack Overflow question as well about you know what things would actually be best to use. And there's a new project that came out only really recently um, called Primus, which has, acts as like a wrapper for all the different socket libraries. So you can just swap out the socket library you want as well, which is pretty nifty. So that way, like yeah, yeah. We had really bad experience with socket IO. Yeah, just mysterious failures, people reporting the things that we had, no way to debug it because it's on somebody's web client somewhere else. Yeah. Uh, oh, you like you basically made it as a client failure. Uh, yeah, like just, pe failure just people reporting that it just didn't work, and we've got no way to debug it because right. we're not getting the connection through. So how can we compute that if we're not getting a connection? Right. Uh, yeah. And so we switched to Stop JS, and it's been one hundred percent failure. Do you think Stop JS is a good solution for live reload, or do you think it's overkill? I think it's fine. It's a much smaller code base. Sweet, so that's it. The website has like so much more detail than I went in there. I, I just try to show you like all the awesomeness in like a very small time frame. Um, Cause yeah, like I, I can talk about this all night and any of the my panic people can as well. <laughs> they all love it as well. So yeah, um, thanks to everybody.